Best Book Bits podcast brings you Warwick Fairfax, who just may be the only person you'll ever meet who's name and phrase lost $2.25 billion appear in the same sentence. But Warwick is not here to talk about what he's lost. He will share the details of what he has come to call his crucible experience. His failed takeover bid at the age of 26 of a media dynasty that has last that has been in the family for 150 years. But what he's really here to inspire us with today is what he's learned from that loss and how these lessons have fueled a life of true significance for him and how you can be the same for each of us. So Warwick, thank you for being on the podcast. Not at all. Thanks, Michael. Uh, great to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your early years, and how the story sort of unfolded for yourself growing up in the Fairfax dynasty? Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, thanks again, Michael. And obviously, Australian listeners will be a little bit familiar, at least, although it's a lot of years ago, and those elsewhere may not be. But yeah, I grew up in a 150-year-old uh, family media dynasty in Sydney. Um, the paper was founded by John Fairfax, a person of faith, uh, back in 1841. And by the time I was growing up, it had grown to be a massive media company owning newspapers, magazines, uh, TV stations, radio. Uh, so for Australian listeners, you know, it had the, you know, seven networks, so Channel 7 in Sydney and, and Brisbane and, um, you know, magazines like Woman's Day. I mean, it was, you know, a massive, uh, massive media conglomerate. And uh, as I tell uh, folks in, in America, um, you know, the main papers we had, Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, and the Australian Financial Review, are the U.S. equivalent of the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal for, you know, international uh, listeners. So it was a massive deal. So, uh, you know, growing up, I was from my dad's third marriage, and my parents and dad definitely saw me as the heir apparent, the other family members involved, but um, that was sort of their vision. So... Um, I was kind of almost like you know, the Bible talks about the prodigal son. Well, I was almost like the son that stayed home and worked hard. So sometimes kids of wealthy backgrounds, they kind of fast cars, drugs. That's kind of the norm, I guess, in some sense. That wasn't me. So I went to a you know good private boys' school in Sydney, uh, Cranbrook, you know, for Sydney listeners. Um, and uh, from there, I did my undergrad at Oxford, like my dad and some other relatives. Worked on Wall Street, got my MBA at Harvard Business School. So I worked hard, I took life seriously, and I felt like this was um, kind of my destiny, if you will. And uh, just the idea of did I want to do this was irrelevant. This is, you know, we weren't just making widgets, you know, unlike some other media companies. The Fairfax family always had this idea that we weren't here to play favors or as Australians would know, some media folks will say, well, I gave such and such prime minister a break because, well, he's a mate. Well, that's irrelevant from our perspective. I don't care if he's a mate or not. It's, it's, you know, what's right for the country is what's relevant, not whether we like ex-politician or ex-businessman. Um, so we always had sort of an independent uh, philosophy of journalism. So to not go in the family business would have felt a bit like, you know, Prince William saying to his dad and Grandmother, I don't, I'm not feeling this whole royalty deal. You know, obviously a bit challenging for uh, Harry, but it, it was just an unthinkable. Was, I, we, we'd be letting down not just my family, but I guess uh, maybe sounding letting the country down sounds a bit uh, a bit much. But there was the sense where, you know, it, I have to do this. So that was sort of a bit of the backdrop of growing up. It was immense pressure, expectations. I didn't even need any lectures. I didn't really get any other than what well, was kind of obvious. You know, this is who I am. This is what I have to do. And I got to prepare myself. So, yeah, that was the upbringing. Yeah. And I want to thank you for sharing that. And I want to circle back to some of the early years in education where you said you studied at Oxford and Harvard. So the school you went to in, in Oxford founded in 1263. Now, a lot of people can't wrap their heads around my um of my history. My family is from England and dates back to I can go back to the 1600s. I'm sure you can go back further. But yeah, talk about the experience going to that that old Oxford school. You know, it's funny, uh, there are a lot of different colleges in Oxford. Um, each of them is sort of independent in, in one sense, bound by the university. And the college I went to at Oxford Balliol, um, it so happened that was sort of the most left-wing and progressive of the colleges. So I did philosophy, politics, and economics, which, funnily enough, my dad had done. So this is like 
late 70s, early 80s, they were so left-wing in my course that, you know, they didn't ask what your political opinion was. It's like, are you Marxist, Leninist, Trotsky, Stalinist, or fascist? Those were the only options. So anybody from other countries, let's say Australia or U.S., if you were just some moderate labor or liberal party person or Republican or Democratic in the U.S., you'd be in the fascist camp because, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't believe in destroying capitalism and having some Marxist state, you were just this right-wing sellout. So it was just a different culture. Um, you know, people were more diverse than some other colleges from, you know, like working class families or from overseas. So it was, it was a lot of pressure because the people there at that college, I always did well in school, but it's kind of like going to Wimbledon, maybe when you played tennis at uni or something. And these folks were geniuses. I, I'd like to think I'm relatively intelligent, but this was a whole nother level. So it's very intimidating. Uh, but the diversity of folks that were there and diversity of viewpoint, I, I enjoyed. So it was intimidating, it was difficult, but it was a good experience. Yeah, I, I like how you unwrapped it in the book a little bit, especially with Harvard and Harvard Business School. And, and talk about people don't understand how the actual studies take place and how you're doing case studies after case studies. And you have to get that little seat in the in the U-shape. Can you talk a little bit about the experience on on that and sort of getting in the scrum and trying to get front and row centers? Yeah, so in Harvard Business School, um, you have about 90 odd students in a horseshoe uh, classroom, if you will. Um, you know, with different kind of levels, almost like a mini amphitheater. And the professor doesn't really do any lecturing. I mean, one of my professors was Michael Porter, who wrote the book Competitive Strategy, one of the all-time go-to books in, you know, in, in the corporate world. Uh, but they would ask penetrating questions. You would start off by giving um, an analysis of the case. Somebody would be picked at random, which they call a cold call. You don't know who's going to be picked, so you've got to be ready. If you were sleeping that, or partying that night or having an interview, you don't want to be cold call and just say, I have nothing. That would be incredibly embarrassing. Uh, and then your 50% of your grade was on class participation. So you know, everybody there was very, very eloquent, very smart. And so 90 hands would go up. Now, it, most folks at uni or in class, 90 hands don't go up when the teacher asks you know, for questions or comments. But they did, and so the first day there, you've got to pick your uh, seat. And uh, you know, if you're way off in the wings up the back, you're not gonna be visible that much. Well, I didn't get the memo, so I got there about 15 minutes early, and I had only about two or three seats to pick from. It's like, oh, okay. And once you pick your seat, yeah, that's it for the year. But you know, professors are good, and they, they find you eventually, but that was intimidating too, in some sense. But the, the level of uh, intelligence from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of business experience, uh, that was an amazing, an amazing environment. It really was. Cool little story in the book. Yeah, take us back to when you were in America and you got the phone call about your father's health and what happened from there and coming back to Australia. Can you talk a little bit about that story before your father's passing? Yeah, yeah. So um, basically the lead up into my father passing in early 87 was, as often happens in family businesses, there was sort of maybe not disunity, but different groups, different factions, in the family going back decades, and there are always reasons, but um, other family members uh, who were significant shareholders threw my dad out as chairman of the company in 1976. I was 15 at the time, and that was absolutely devastating. I love my dad, I thought he was a great man. He was like 74 at the time, and great health. Uh, so that was a bit of the psychological backdrop, although I didn't quite consciously realize it. So ever since then, my dad definitely saw me as kind of the heir apparent, you know, um, I see Warwick as somebody that can kind of, I don't know, maybe raise my legacy again. So um, basically uh, in early 87, when he died, I felt like, okay, uh, the mantle was on me. And there were a number of factors that led up to the takeover. Um, I felt the company, at least the, the you know, journals were being a bit more sensational maybe than it had been. I felt the company wasn't being run well. There was an aborted takeover or the herald and weekly times that at the time owned the melbourne herald and brisbane Courier mail some big properties that murdoch ended up getting most of and we felt at least i felt like we kind of were like sort of a you know a dollar late or a dollar short or whatever the expression was so you know some abortive capital raising schemes and, and whether my reasons were valid is not really so much relevant that was my truth my viewpoint 
all this led to me thinking in my young, in my youthful naivety and crusader mentality, which is a not a, always a helpful combination. Something needed to be done. My dad had died. The stock price of the company rocketed up because fifty percent of the company was publicly held. So the Sydney Stock Exchange, as then was, felt the company was in play. So rightly or wrongly, that was the market's perspective um, with my dad dying. So then, in late August '87. I launched this $2.25 billion takeover for those reasons, you know, management, vision, all that kind of thing. And I didn't want to be in control. I just, well, I didn't want to, excuse me, I wanted to be in control, but not, I didn't care about titles. I could work in the marketing department. So I said to some of these other prominent family members, you can keep your titles and all that. I just want to see it be well run. Well, you know, what, what rational person is going to want to be trapped in a privatized company run by a 26 year old? No, nobody. So very understandably, they sold out and high to the uh, you know stock market. They you know it's like hundreds of millions. I mean it was you know obviously uh, you know they uh, got a fair amount out. But again, I don't blame them. I'm, I was the one that almost forced their hand. October '87 stock market crash at our asset sales. So we had an unsustainable level of debt between the you know October 87 crash and my family selling out so by the end of 87 we had a way too high debt I brought in new management they did increase operating profits 80 percent showing maybe the company could have been better managed but it didn't matter because with the debt when Australia got in the big recession in 1990 the company went bankrupt so here I had this grand vision and what I did directly led to turmoil, you know, family, at least employees, it's like about a 4,000 plus $700 million company at the time. Employees are thinking, well, we feel safe with the family, and, you know, using the word like safe space. This feels a safe space, but who, who knows it's going to earn us now? So I didn't mean to cause turmoil and, uh, you know, angst within the family or employees, but I did. Uh, yet I, it was never my intention. I had good intentions, I thought, but Terrible things happen despite my, yeah, with my crusader mentality is a good way to describe it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And it's one of those things like sometimes good, bad things happen to good people. And, you know, it seems like you're one of the good guys and you had, you did have good intentions. And how can you control a country's recession? I mean, you can't. Like, look at the, you look at what's happening in the world right now with the situation around the world and, you know, market prices are fluctuating. You, can, you can't control the market. So before talking about what happened after that, let's let's go back a little bit further and just talk about the history of sort of it's it's five generations and how it started in 1841 if you want to give listeners a little history lesson on um your great 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 grandfather yeah yeah absolutely so <clears throat> my great great grandfather john fairfax um he started a whole paper in uh the county of warwickshire in england hence i guess my name and my dad's name of warwick and uh he had this, this paper and he wrote a story about a local lawyer and that lawyer sued him. Now the judge found in John Fairfax's favor saying that article was accurate, but it didn't matter back then, the legal system was different and you had to pay your own court costs. So despite the fact that the judge found a favor of John Fairfax, he was bankrupted. So for some, they might've said, look, forget it, starting your own business is, is, is folly, you know, people are gonna just knife you in the back, what's the point? But at that point he said, well, you know, maybe we need to move. And so he took the four to six month journey to Australia as then was, it was not, not an easy journey back then. And he ended up starting this uh, paper with a business partner of his, um, and it grew into an enormous company. But what was interesting is, um, you know, he had a very strong faith, faith in Christ, which is sort of very important to me. But what was interesting is, you know, he was an elder at his church, the Pitt Street Congregational Church. It still stands in Pitt Street, Sydney today, believe it or not. Um, and he was a great dad, a uh, great husband. His employees loved him. Uh, you know, his employees after he died said, you know, we've lost a kind and valuable employer. I mean, who says that in 1800s businesses? I mean, there weren't unions, there weren't worker rights. It was a pretty much a free for all. You could do whatever you want, but yet they felt like he was a beloved employer. So that ethos of service to the community and probably one other bit of the story that's interesting the original masthead of the paper was, may Whigs call me Tory, and may Tory call me Whigs, which in modern language means may liberal call me conservative, conservative call me liberal. It was always the goal to be an independent paper. And so through generations, there was this just sense of service and, you know, 
it, it was, I mean, the, the pressure from that was immense. The other thing that's interesting, which doesn't exist in Australia anymore, but there were three knighthoods in a row in my family. There was John's son, Sir James Redding Fairfax, Sir James Oswald Fairfax, and my father, Sir Warwick Fairfax. Now, understandably, you know, Australia doesn't offer knighthoods anymore, but they were all earned in their own right for the contribution to the community. So, yeah, it was just a legacy of service, which in one sense, to have that kind of legacy uh, is amazing. In another sense, it's a lot to live up to. Yeah, that's what I found in the book. Yeah, you know, being 26 and thrown into the the thrust of a 150-year-old family dynasty and how you just broke that down with three knighthoods. And it's, and I know it goes back further than the 1800s as well and, and um, that, but we can we can talk about that later. Let's fast forward to, you know, your decision to, to leave the country at the age of sort of, was it 30 or so and, on, and after everything happened. How did that unfold and what was the thought process behind that on leaving Australia? Yeah, that was tough because, um, look, Australia is a wonderful country and, uh, you know, um, it's funny, you know, I still follow what's going on there pretty closely and it sounds kind of crazy since I've lived in America for 30 years, but... I actually still follow cricket, you know, you can, there's an obscure channel in this country which you can actually follow it on cable, so I actually watch, watch quite a bit of the ashes, so kind of go figure, but um, yeah, I mean, it was tough. My wife was American who I met in Australia, but it was such a public debacle that I felt like I couldn't have a normal life. I mean, when the company went under, the three major commercial TV networks were on our door, Channel 7, Channel 9, on Channel 10, like the big TV trucks and what's happening. And I was on front page of the newspapers back during my time there. I had editorial cartoons written of me. My kind of least favorite is how do you start a small business, give Warwick Fairfax a big one. I mean, that was savage. So I just felt like it was so painful. I just wanted to live a normal life, which I couldn't have. So it was very painful. Uh, Australia is a wonderful country, but you know, we, we go back every year or two. My kids have all spent plenty of time in Australia. In fact, I had a daughter that worked there for a couple of years because all my kids are dual citizens. But yeah, that was basically for me to find myself, to carry on with life, which was really, really difficult. I couldn't do it in Australia. And my wife's American, as I said, so that gave me the option. It wasn't an easy decision, but it, I felt like I had no choice. You know, I had to leave. I think 99% of people in your boots, those big shoes, would have done the same. And yeah, I would have... I would have gone as well, but yeah, talk a little about sort of in the in the nineties with your wife Gail and your three uh, beautiful kids as well, living in Maryland. What was uh, what was the nineties like and starting your new life for, from scratch? I know you had a period of doing nothing and then finding um talk us about sort of your first sort of small job that you got and flying under the radar, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So the nineties were tough. I mean, I don't know that I was clinically depressed, but I was just. I'm somebody that's why that if something's wrong in the world, I just assume it's my fault. That's my default psychology, which is not necessarily say healthy, but that's my default. And so I felt like I'd let my dad down. I'd let my family down. You know, I'd let I don't know, thousands of employees down with instability. They didn't all lose their jobs, but there was this uncertainty of who's going to own us. And because I was a person of faith and, and still am in some weird cosmic sense, I felt like I had got, let God down, and that was that was the worst for any person of faith or whatever value system you have. If you feel like the universe or God, the, I felt like that must be why I'm here on Earth to kind of bring back not just the values of the founder and how people are treated and respected and what have you. Um, to feel like there was a grand plan and I, I let God down and family and everybody, that was just it was absolutely crippling. Uh, so it took years to find my way back, but. I guess basically those small baby steps to resurrecting my self-esteem that was just decimated was, you know, when you go through a crucible that either, you know, uh, pulls you away from your faith or value system or draws you in. It's, it's a binary choice. You move closer in or further away. For me, I just moved closer in and I felt like if God had wanted it to work out despite my, na my naivety and stupidity, it, you know, he would have, it would have. So maybe God had a better plan for me and uh, he actually, I think, did uh, in some ways, a lot of ways. Uh, my wife, I've been married over 30 years. She you know, loves me unconditionally. She didn't need millions or billions. We were fine. You know, we weren't on the streets. Um, so that unconditional love of a partner or spouse is huge. Having young kids, they just knew me as dad. They didn't 
know anything about, you know, Fairfax Media, I didn't really care. And so eventually um, I found a job uh, in doing a, a business and financial analysis at a local aviation services company in Maryland. This is like in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s, just pre-internet, and so they couldn't really Google me, and you know, uh, so that was um, fortunate. Uh, and I found, you know, I was pretty good at spreadsheets back then. I'd worked in a bank in New York, so drip by drip, drop by drop, I felt like there were things I could do and, and do well. I mean, it, it, it wasn't great for my ego in the sense that I felt like I was probably the lowest paid Harvard Business School graduate in history because I wasn't getting paid much. I was getting paid what the position was worth. I, I don't care about money, really, but it was more an ego thing. It's like, huh, yeah, maybe I've got, you know, buddies that might be senior executives somewhere and I'm just, you know. But little bit by little bit, I, I began to resurrect my self-esteem and find things I could do without screwing up. So it was a long process of coming back. Yeah, again, you know, the story's amazing. And for people that uh, don't understand, going through the, the ups and downs and the highs and lows, I want you to talk about your experience in church and how you were sitting there one time and the I think the pastor or preacher said, come up and share your story. And you're like, who's going to resonate with this story? But talk about that experience and then how that then started the new chapter in your life. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just as sort of the lead up to that, uh, I was beginning to resurrect my self-esteem. I became an executive coach, uh, which I found was great. I, I began to find a leadership voice through asking questions. I became an elder at my church, which is like a non-denominational evangelical church of about 2,000 odd. Uh, I was on the board of my kid's school, which is a Christian school. And so I was beginning to find my voice a little bit. And so the pastor of my church was giving a, a message and he wanted me to, you know, give a 10-minute talk as a sermon illustration. And it's like, well, you know, okay, I'm not Mr. Public Speaker, certainly not back then, but if I can give, uh, uh, you know, a, a message or something that's helpful, uh, I will. And so I talked about my story and what I felt like since it was a church, maybe some lessons, some lessons that I felt like God had taught me. But what it's amazing is, you know, in America, they know nothing about Australia. You know, Harbour Bridge, Kangaroos, I mean, they're not really, Fairfax Media, meaningless. Sydney Morning Herald, unless you're in media, you're not going to have heard of it. So, um, but I remember thinking, you know, weeks and months after people came up to me and said, you know, Warwick, your story really resonated. I, I, I mean, nobody knows anything about Australia. There weren't any other media moguls or, you know, it's just an average cross section of America. But somehow by me sharing that story, my story openly, vulnerably, and with some lessons, people could f find themselves in my story. This still boggles my mind. How could anybody find themselves in my story? My story is not about being a cancer survivor or survivor abuse, which sadly way too many people have been through this. This is a pretty unique story. I've not met too many other, I've not met any who have said, yeah, I launched a $2 billion takeover of a family media company. I failed too. I've not. I've never met that person yet, you know. So, yeah, some that that time in church changed my life because I thought if I can write a book about my story that helps other people, that is worth writing. And so that really it it changed the, the direction of my life. Well, certainly it was a huge pivot point that message in two thousand and eight. Yeah, it was uh, it was great reading that in the book as well, and I like I like how open and honest you are as well. For and we'll we'll get into your book in a second. I like to talk a little bit if you you can about about your mother and what sort of role she played in your life as well and in the family too a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So my mother, who you know was ninety five when she died in twenty seventeen, she was this larger than life figure. You know, Lady Mary Fairfax. My dad was reserved, would rather, you know, read philosophy or books or books on religion, you know, comparative religion. He was more, I guess, ecumenical in his thinking perhaps than I am. Um, very brilliant man, but he, you know, he didn't, he didn't want to go to parties every night. Well, my mother was very outgoing and she loved it. So she could have a party for 300 like it was nothing. You know, she'd have people from Hollywood that come to Australia and their friends would say, look, you need to look up Lady Mary Fairfax because she'll give you a party like you're not used to. This is in Hollywood. You know, it's not so much the money, it was just the, the care, the attention to detail, the, the feeling. And so, you know, she was this force of nature, very driven, very determined. I mean, she, she you know, had a successful, uh, I don't know, seven plus fashion shops when she was in, in the 20s all over, you know, in Sydney. I mean, she was just a, a, an entrepreneur. So, 
Yeah, I mean, I guess from my father, I get sort of a contemplative, reflective side, but beneath my reserved exterior, I think I get some of the, the passion and determination that she had. So she was, um, she was an amazing person uh, in many ways, set up a lot of philanthropy. So, uh, you know, she, uh, you know, if there was a wall in front of her, she would find a way around it. No obstacle was too big. She would always, I mean, she was amazing that way. You know, never say die, you know, so an amazing person. Yeah, awesome, awesome story. And yeah, I read up uh, a few things on on your mother, and that, that was great. Talk about how the book sort of came about. What made you put the the book about? And give us your definition on what is crucible, because I've got one here. But I'd like to hear your definition of the title of the book. Yeah. So basically, yeah. I mean, I thought I never wanted to write a book that said I was right, they were wrong, and get into details of dissing other members of my family, because that's those books are boring and frankly as I said I don't really blame them for, for selling because you know pretty much gave them no choice uh, so I wanted to talk more about my mistakes in a lessons learned format that can help people and a book about leadership so that was really what was in my uh, what was in my heart and kind of why I wanted to um, why I wanted to write the book it took years to write and it was very painful but basically to answer your question about what is a crucible you know, I define a crucible as a very painful, life-transforming moment. Who you are now is not the same as who you were before. There's the before the crucible and there's the after. It could be business failure. It could be uh, abuse. I mean, we have our own podcast, Beyond the Crucible. We've probably done 90, 100 plus interviews of different folks from every background, race, gender. And they all have crucibles. We've got everybody from a Navy SEAL that was, you know, paralyzed in a training accident, victims of abuse, business failure. <clears throat> but they've all found a way to bounce back. So really, I guess another way of looking at a crucible is um, a crucible is like this hot, uh, you know, molten metal. And it sort of heats it up to another level. And what it becomes afterwards is different. So a crucible is this life-transforming moment that, you know, you have a choice. Is it going to destroy you or you're going to become something new? But there's, you know, there's no other, it's a binary choice. It's a, it's a excruciatingly painful experience. Yeah. And sometimes these moments, as, as we said before, it's not our doing, it's not our choice. And sometimes in life, you, you get hit with the cricket bat, you know, at the back of the head and you just got to pick up the pieces and say, shit, what are you know, what now? What do I do now? In the book, you talk about, yeah, your setbacks and failures, and they aren't the end of our stories. What's the first step to bouncing back from what you call a crucible experience, and, and what does that process look like broadly after that? Yeah, I mean, the first one is you've got to learn the lessons of your crucible, uh, and it differs depending on if it's your fault or not your fault. Certainly in my case, it was... Um, uh, you know, I wasn't designed to be, uh, you know, media mogul, corporate raider type. I'm a reflective advisor type. I don't like making 100 decisions before breakfast, but, you know, true CEOs need to do that. Don't overly reflect on things. Just make a decision. And if you've made a mistake, course correct. That's what good CEOs do. Well, that's just not me. So I was living somebody else's design, not mine. I was living not even my dad. My dad would have been a good philosophy professor at university. So, you know, I have had, you know, maybe, you know, several, at least a couple of generations of ones who, at least with my dad, who wasn't living necessarily his design in some ways. So you got to live in light of your design. You can't inherit a vision. So that was some of the huge lessons. And I guess, you know, moving on from that is, okay, you learn the lessons. And part of that, frankly, is forgiveness. It can be forgiving others or yourself. And when I say forgiveness, especially if it's something that was done to you, let's say it's abuse, it doesn't mean that what was done to you was right. You never condone the abuse. You never condone the act. But the reason forgiveness is important, even if you think what was done was unforgivable, is you, you know, you're trapped in almost like a prison or you know, drinking poison. You know, so you're worth it. That's why you need to forgive, which is a whole other story. So that's part of it. And then bouncing back from that is there's a lot of healing if you can find your purpose or your calling, what we call a life of significance, life on purpose dedicated to serving others. So as you use, you know, amidst your pain, there's often the seeds of a compelling vision. It could be to help other cancer survivors, abuse survivors. Uh, for me, 
I like telling stories of other people, including my own, and how they bounce back. I like to think of us as dealers in hope. You know, how do you bounce back? How do you find your calling? So, um, yeah, and I think as you're finding your vision and your calling in the world, uh, it's got to be anchored in your fundamental beliefs. I'm open about my Christian faith, but look, you know, whether it's Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, or some other philosophy, we all believe something. So whatever your beliefs are, don't ignore that, you know, make sure your life and your, le your leadership and your vision is anchored in whatever it is you believe, and that's up to you. So, you know, good, you know, there, can, there can be seeds of great things, of a great vision that can come out of pain, uh, but it's not easy, it takes a while, but you've got to make that choice. Am I going to let this defeat me and be angry and bitter for the next 30, 40, 50 years until life ends? It's like, you know, this was awful, but how are we going to use this for a higher purpose? Yeah, it reminds me a little bit about the, the grief cycle and what you went through was grief and, you know, coming through that is, is seeds of opportunity and, and to help inspire others. To circle back a little bit, you, you spoke about your father and philosophy. I believe he was writing a book on purpose before he died. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, he, he, he did. I mean, he, he wrote a book. Um, I don't I have to confess I've memorized it, but it's something like, you know, what is the purpose of my life, you know, to live beyond my understanding, to act beyond my love. And, you know, what was remarkable about my dad is, um, you know, he wrote a book uh, before Purpose, uh, you know, The Triple Abyss. Um, and both books are a bit about finding purpose amidst uh, different religions, whether it's Christianity, Buddhism, uh, Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and so he was, he was all about that. But one of the things that was remarkable to me is he just had this sense of, of forgiveness. And despite what happened in 76, and other family members removed him as best he could. I remember asking him, you know, uh, about it, and he said, "Well, I need to forgive both because it's the right thing to do from a faith perspective. I mean, he, I think he even used the word because that's what God would have me do. But also, it's best for you and the family company. And I don't pretend it was perfect, but his model of, of forgiveness and uh, trying to do the right thing, intellectual curiosity. You know, he was moderately conservative, I'd say." But one of his good friends was Bob Hawke, former prime minister, former head of the trade unions. Back when my dad was kind of hanging out with him in the 70s, so to speak, he was pretty left wing, you know, but heading up the trade unions. So their philosophy couldn't be more different, but he enjoyed the conversation. Um, so he was intellectually curious, which I really admire. He's not, you know, stuck in his own political silo. So yeah, there's a lot to, he was a great man and not perfect, but a lot to, I, I learned a lot from him as well. Yeah, that's awesome. I would love, what was it like growing up with a, a famous library? I'm sure your family library would, uh, would have been long and extensive. Do you have any thoughts or do you have any, uh, did you, what was the family library like? Uh, I mean, it was amazing. Yeah, I mean, every kind of, you know, religious, philosophical history. He loved history. I loved history. And that's the way we kind of communicated. When I was a little boy, I'd say, Daddy, tell me some history, and off he'd go. I mean, you know, if I had stuff to do for school, obviously I took books from the library or, or the bookshelf, but I just would ask him. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what aspect of history, he would know, he would know and would go on and about it. And so, yeah, his, his, he was so well-read and um, has such a vast knowledge of history that uh, it's, I still love history to this day because of him. Maybe some kids grow up talking about sports or about whatever. Um, we talked about history. The, the one funny anecdote I put in the book, which Australians will uh, find amusing. You know, my dad grew up uh, before World War I, back when there was a generation of Australians that viewed as England as the mother country. They would actually say the mother country, pre-World War I. And so, um, you know, back in the 70s, you know, heyday of some great cricket teams with, you know, Ian Chappell, Dennis Lilly, Jeff Thompson, all, all those folks. And unfortunately, Australia were doing very well. He would cheer for England. I say, Dad, we've been in Australia since the 1830s. Don't you think this is taking love of the mother country a bit far? And I don't know if he did it to annoy me, which it was very successful, drove me nuts. But I just, I just, there was a grain of truth in that. It wasn't all just, just to needle me. It just, I don't know. He grew up in a different generation of Australians in which they actually viewed England as the mother country. I mean, it's fine to respect England, but oh, it's taken a bit far. You, you don't take it into cricket. That's, that's a line way too far. <laughs> 
my family comes from Norwich and yeah, I obviously because my you know, half my family's, you know, born and raised there and they come on in on the boats, I think in the seventies. But anyway, but uh, that's a that's a that's a funny story about the, the mother Mother England. Now in the book you recount a lot of historical stories about, you know, leadership as well and, and how they went through hardships and challenges too. Sort of what story stands out for you, especially in you know, how we can move beyond a a crucible can you share some stories gosh i mean yeah i mean i i love um history there's sort of a uh, <clears throat> a lot i mean i think probably <clears throat> one of the ones that um obviously listeners will be familiar with uh, abraham lincoln um what's amazing about his story obviously he became uh president in uh, 1861 at, when the civil war was breaking out which you know caused massive amount of lives and carnage but what's interesting is he was so authentic and you know, he grew up in the then wilds of Illinois that seemed to be the, you know, in nowhere. And the other members of his cabinet um, were rivals for the Republican nomination. There's a great book by Doris Kearns Goodwin, Team of Rivals, that gives you a lot more detail into this. But basically, they came in thinking, here's this country bumpkin, this idiot, unschooled. He has no business being president. The wrong man is one. Yet by the end of it, they thought he was the greatest man that ever lived. Well, how do you go from people thinking that you're an uneducated country bumpkin to do you're the greatest man that's ever lived? That's an incredible leadership transformation. Part of it was uh, he was so authentic. He had incredible courage. He was actually very politically savvy, which people don't realize. So, you know, um, he was a great man in so many ways. He could make tough decisions, but yet bring a team who thought he was an idiot to believing this guy is the greatest man we've ever known. It was really, it was the greatness of his character that was why Lincoln is always voted by American historians as the number one president. So every few years they do a survey, it's always, so it's, you want to be great as a leader, it's greatness and character that really separates, that really defines greatness, and certainly does in Lincoln's case, and we can learn a lot from his example really is a human being, frankly. Yeah, an amazing, amazing story on on Lincoln. There's so many books and movies created from you know a mythical man that we sort of look back. But you you write at length in the book about the power of sort of authenticity and and vulnerability in leadership. Why is that so important? Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, you know authenticity is so important. I mean, basically, you know, we live in the world of the inauthentic, whether it's politicians or, you know, Hollywood people, you know, every hair in place and let's put on the persona and let's do, you know, public opinion polls to see what it is I should believe. And, you know, I think we live in an age where I think young people especially, I'd say, want authenticity and real more than any other generation. And they're just tired of the fake. So if you want to be a leader and inspire the best and the brightest of the next generation, if you're not authentic, people will say, forget this, I'm, I'm leaving. We, we have more opportunities than we've ever had. There's more um, mobility within jobs uh, than there's ever been. So I think, you know, the reason people are not authentic is uh, they're afraid to be themselves because if they see the real me and I'm rejected, the, you know, if you reject a mask, it's one thing, if you reject me, you're rejecting my identity. Well, that's a huge thing to deal with. So it's having the courage to be you, whatever that means. Uh, and so, you know, people want to follow the real, they don't want to follow the fake. And, you know, uh, you know, just not only be authentic in terms of who you are, but be real with your team. So if things aren't going well, don't say everything's great. And then next day you file a bankruptcy. I mean, there's appropriate levels of sharing. You don't need to get into every gory detail with every member of your team, but at a, an appropriate, like you do with, with your kids. You know, you don't tell them everything that's going on, but you, know, you don't tell them nothing. You know, you, you, you know what's, at, what's at the appropriate level uh, for who I'm communicating with? So authenticity is so important and it takes courage. And again, why aren't people authentic? Because they're afraid to be rejected if people see the real selves. I guess the last point on this is, I talk about vulnerability for a purpose. So I'm not talking about sharing every dumb thing you ever did in high school. So what? Who cares? But if you're, if you're in a company and somebody's just starting out in some small venture and they're having a real tough time, it's not going well, you know, it's the first time they've had anybody reporting to them. Sharing, you know, I remember when I first had my team of five people reporting to me, I was scared stiff and actually it, it kind of blew up and it's a miracle I wasn't fired. And now I'm the CEO of a 5,000 person company. 
Now, that story is going to motivate people. Like, gosh, if Fred or Mary can get through that, I guess there's hope for me too. So that's authenticity. That's vulnerability with a purpose. It's so important. You know, be real, but be real intentionally, not just sharing every dimwitted thing you've ever done. So authenticity can be an incredibly powerful tool, frankly. Yeah, and at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're all human. So, you know, when someone takes the hat, the CEO hat off and talks to you as a human, you actually not only get more respect from that person, but, you know, you see their human element as well. And I think we go into that, that age now where we know that, you know, our role is not necessarily who you are as a, as a person. Um, you need to bring the person into the role. And, and that's, you know, combining that that authenticity that you talk about uh, with, with leadership as well. I want you to sort of discuss a little bit about sort of some of the lessons that you've learned from your faith-based and uh, inspirational leaders. What what personal story is particularly instructive in, in moving beyond a, a crucible? So do you have any examples of your faith-based and inspirational leaders? Yeah, I think, you know, I've mentioned that faith is really sort of the cornerstone of, of who you are. It's... Uh, you know, it's important to understand what you believe. And, you know, my attitude just when we talk about faith, just so that listeners can understand, I'm clear about my faith in Christ. It's, you know, I guess of the evangelical variety. But I believe everybody has the God-given right to choose their own path, whether it's a different religion or a different philosophy. So, you know, find that. I mean, there's a lot of inspiring uh, folks. I think one example would be, uh, you know, King David in the Bible that most people are familiar with. Um, you know, one of the greatest uh, kings in Israel's history, but yet the guy was not, uh, the guy was not perfect. He made horrendous mistakes, you know, um, the kind of mistakes that you would uh, go to jail for, frankly. You know, he, um, uh, he was married and uh, out across the window on some other rooftop, he saw uh, Bathsheba and uh, I don't know, I forget all the details, maybe he didn't have much on or what have you, but she, she, he coveted Bathsheba. And so she was married to uh, like an army commander, Uriah. And so Israel was fighting somebody at the time. And so he said to his commanders, I want you to put Uriah in the front lines and then everybody could step back. And so, and that way, and he was killed. He set him up, he basically murdered him. He, he, organized, he arranged a situation where Uriah was about 90% certain of dying and then he married Bathsheba. And uh, the prophet Nathan comes to David and says, you know, um, he, he gave a story like if such and such happened, what would you do? Oh, that person would be, I'd, you know, take him to task. Well, that's, that person's you. Uh, and he repented and said, yep, this was awful. And, you know, he realized what he did was wrong. So that's a very extreme case. Not all of us will have committed that. I mean, that's about as bad as you can get. So leaving aside the specific example, it's, you know, we're all going to make mistakes, hopefully not ones quite at that horrendous level. But I think we both have to repent, whatever that means for us. And, uh, you know, atone, there can be specific things we need to do to atone, depending on the circumstance, but then forgive ourselves. I realize that example seems pretty unforgivable, frankly, I don't know quite how you do that. But um, I think his, his life is, um, always putting, you know, the Lord first. He, was, again, was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But it's, it's a powerful example of when you make mistakes, hopefully not quite that bad, your life's not over and just dig down deep into whatever your faith perspective means. It's a great story. And you either have to either forgive yourself or the story itself is going to be forgotten anyway with the passing of time. So forgive and forget or uh, be forgotten. And yeah, thank you for sharing. Look, there's so much to unpack in this book and we're going to run out of time, which we are. So yeah, the, the book is not just about sort of leadership principles. It's a collection of, you know, parables, reflections and lessons and, you know, stories and leadership principles. And from your, you, you're talking about your life and it's one of the most amazing stories, like a personal memoir that, that I've read, but you're sort of in the second half of your life in terms of how it's sort of unfolded so far. And there's many more, um, many more things and, and great things ahead of you as well. So what are you sort of working on now or in the future? Is there any more books coming out or is... Well, it took me years to write this book. So that'll be, you never say never, but not for a while. But it's really through the book and, you know, podcasts Beyond the Crucible, we have an assessment. We have all sorts of, you know, we're thinking about this year. Do we, you know, whether it's masterminds, e-courses, basically it's how do we get the message broader and deeper? And, you know, it's funny, 
money has never been a motivator through a, a great blessing. We're now very comfortable. Um, uh, so that's you know not really an issue for me. So, but money, empire building, it's all irrelevant. It's all dust. I, I could care less. I know that's easy to say, you know, obviously, you know, uh, but it's honestly what I believe. But it's more about how can I help people so that their worst day doesn't have to define them? How can I give people hope? I'm all about giving people hope no matter what background, race, religion, what, whoever they are. I want to feel like their life isn't over if today's the worst day. So we're all about that message of hope. And so we're looking at what are some different ways we can bring that message of hope to more people but also find ways to deepen that message in practical ways so they can find their way back, which, again, we don't sugarcoat stuff. It's not like three easy lessons and in two days, you know, everything will be honky-dory. Life is not like that. It took me most of the 90s to bounce back. So you bounce back, bouncing back from your worst day, it can take a long time. It can take everything from therapy, which, you know, I had a bit of back in the 90s. It, and I, I'm a great advocate for you seek help wherever you can seek help. You know, um, don't be too proud. If that's just silly. But um, yeah, w so we're all about how do we, you know, stop your worst day being your worst day, and how do we help people bounce back? It, it's all about the message and and sharing other people's stories of hope. Because you know, I'm inspired when I hear other people's stories. I mean, it just blows my mind w what people can come back from. It's just uh, I'll give you one maybe final story that's been on my mind a lot. Uh, we did a series on resilience uh, last year, and there's an Australian woman from Sydney, Stacey Kopass, and uh, she was uh, diving into an above-ground pool somewhere in the suburbs of Sydney. You know, above-ground pools are not that deep. She's 12 or 13, and her parents kept telling her, Stacey, don't do it. Don't, don't jump into a pool. Well, when you're young, you just ignore your parents. She dove into that pool and became diagnosed as a quadriplegic. And so... She, understandably, she had thoughts of suicide and substance abuse. I mean, she was very athletic, too, before that. But she's found a way to bounce back. She speaks, she consults, and she said what she went through was a blessing, was a gift. And I can't, I can't even fathom how that could be a gift. That's reframing on an, an incredible basis, but it's, it's this sense that she obviously wouldn't have liked to go gone through that, but she's found a way to use her pain to help others. So Stories like that, I just can't, I can't get that story out of my mind. It just blows my mind. I just, it's like, gosh, I need to learn. I complain about what I went through. What I went through is nothing compared to what Stacy went through. So those stories inspire me. And I, I'd like to tell other people those stories so they can hear it and, and, and learn from people like Stacy. I met parents of a, of, a, of a person. I don't know the, the person, the child, but um, doing the exact same thing, diving into a pool and becoming a, a quadriplegic. So when you said that story, it triggered in my mind. I met the devastated parents of that. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that story, but yeah, thank you for people that want to find the book. I want to share the message of the book as well. Where can they buy the book? Where can they reach you? Is it the website, uh, Amazon? Where would people uh, best be able to... Um, get a copy of the book absolutely well again thank you so much michael so um the book is crystal leadership embrace your trials to lead a life of significance you can get it amazon wherever books are sold i think you can even get it in agus and robertson's for uh, you know australian listeners so you can get it kind of everywhere um so uh and you know for more about me you can go to my website crucibleleadership.com we have a podcast beyond the crucible which is you know apple podcast spotify you know a bunch of other places I'm active on uh, LinkedIn under Warwick Fairfax. As Australians will know, uh, Warwick with the silent W. Nobody knows that in America. I get Warwick all the time, but what are you going to do? Uh, and uh, as well as Facebook under Crucible Leadership. Thank you for being uh, an amazing guest on the Best Book Bits podcast. Thank you for your book. Thank you for your story. And thank you for being open and, and sharing that with the world as well. Like without you writing the book, you know, you could have easily just slid into uh, the private life, but you put yourself back out there in the public life as well. So yeah, thank you for everything that you've done. Warwick, enjoy the rest of your day. And yeah, thank you for being a guest. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It was wonderful to be here.